Hi, and welcome to our final tutorial for SPPH 500. In this tutorial, we'll discuss the final exam and review the course material, including the four main modeling approaches that we've learned in the course. So first, let's start with the final exam. There will be three general types of questions on the exam. The first set of questions will ask about concepts in relation to model fitting. For example, what's the difference between a predictive and effect size model? What's an offset? Why do we use one? What does it mean for a variable to be an effect modifier? If you wanted to determine if a variable was a confounder or an effect modifier, how would you do this? What steps would you take to determine this? I just want to note that I haven't seen the actual exam, so don't hold me to any of this or read into what I'm saying too much, but these are just examples of questions that could be asked. The second type of question will provide our output and ask for interpretations. This is similar to what we've done in tutorials, so interpreting unexponentiated and exponentiated coefficients. So for example, the log odds and odds ratios if we have logistic regression output. Another example could be an interaction term in our output. Let's say we're interested in the effect of education on contraceptive use, and we're interested in if this varies by ethnicity. There could be output from a regression model including an interaction term between education and ethnicity, and you would be expected to know how to calculate strata-specific odds ratios based on this. It could also be that you're given simple regression output, and then output for when a second x variable is added to the model, and the question asks, based on this output, do you think this second x variable should be kept in the model? Is it a confounder? So is there a large change in the primary x coefficient? And if not, is it another predictor or collinear with the primary x? So if there's a decrease in the standard error associated with beta 1, this suggests it's a predictor. But if there's a large increase in the standard error, this suggests that the second variable is collinear with the primary x variable. The final group of questions will describe a scenario and ask you to suggest and justify an appropriate model or method of analysis. So it could be that we're interested in the effect of gender on death rate. Which type of regression would you use? So knowing when it's appropriate to use different types of regression models. Another example could be that residual or diagnostic plots are shown for the regression model. And you could be asked, what assumptions are violated here and how could these potentially be addressed? So now I'm just going to go over my general approach to model building, just to hopefully tie together some of the pieces from the different regression models that we've learned throughout the course. So obviously in the exam, you're not going to be given a data set and asked to fit a model or anything, but I think if you understand the overall process, it might be helpful for you in answering questions, especially for that third group of questions where you're given a scenario and asked, what would you do? Depending on what step you're at in the process of model building. So before you start anything, of course you're going to want to know what the aim of your study is. Why are you building this model? What type of question are you trying to answer? Is it a predictive or effect size model? We know that this is definitely going to influence the way we decide on variable selection for our model. What is your primary outcome? How is it measured? This is important because it will determine which type of regression you'll use. So if you have a continuous outcome, you'll use a linear model. If it's binary, you'll use logistic regression. If it's a rate or count, you'll use Poisson. And if it's survival or time to event, you should use Cox regression. And then you also want to think about the explanatory variables that you have available and which are going to be important. So it's important to think through all of these things before you decide how you'll approach the model building process. So the next step is exploratory data analysis. You have lots of experience with this now based on your work on the assignments. So if you were interested in a relationship between a continuous X variable and a categorical outcome variable, which plots or types of bivariate analyses would you use? So you should be familiar with all of these different types of plots and summaries so that you can get a feel for your data and understand relationships between, for example, potential confounders and your primary X and Y variable, 
if you're building an effect size model. Also, you want to look at the distribution of your primary outcome and explanatory variables, as well as the relationship between these and other variables that you're interested in. This exploratory analysis will also help you to identify potential outliers or errors in your data. So you might be given some of this information on the exam, but you obviously won't have to do this with a data set or anything. So once you've gotten an overall feel for your data and know what you want to do, my approach is generally to start with a simple model and work my way up by adding variables, especially if it's an effect size model. But you could also start with a full model that includes all of the variables that you're interested in and then try removing these. And that might make more sense to you if you're building a predictive model, but can also be done when building effect size models. Either approach is fine. It's just doing what makes sense to you and having a plan in place, either building up or trying to drop variables and then see what happens. But before you put anything in the model, you always want to think through conceptually as you add or remove variables, especially with regard to confounding. So for example, if you were interested in the relationship between injection drug use and HIV incidence, would you adjust for syringe sharing as a confounder? No, because it's likely on the causal pathway between injection drug use and HIV incidence. And also, you want to make sure that you don't put two X variables in a model that are measuring the exact same thing, because this will result in collinearity. And you don't want to include an X variable that is an alternative measure of the outcome. When I'm building a model, I usually like to check the most obvious confounders first, based on theoretical considerations, and then check others that maybe are less likely to confound the association later on. So there are lots of different ways you can do this, but the most important thing is that you have a plan and you stick to that plan. So thinking through conceptually before you add or try removing a variable and examining bivariable associations between the potential confounder and your primary X and Y variables. And then you would wanna look at the change in beta one if you're building an effect size model, but you wouldn't do this if it's a predictive model because you don't care about confounding. And then you could use the partial F test or likelihood ratio test, or look at the change in the AIC BIC to see if adding a variable increases the model predictive power. As you're doing this, you're watching for collinearity. And we already talked about how you would do this. You look for a large increase in the standard error. And of course, your decision about whether or not to keep a variable in the model depends on the goal of your model. So if you're building an effect size model, Again, you're just mainly concerned with controlling for confounding, but you could also include another predictor to increase the precision of your estimates. If you're building a predictive model, you're going to want to keep in anything that's going to help you predict your outcome the best. If you find that a variable is collinear in either a predictive or effect size model, it's best to remove one of the two collinear variables, which we've talked about earlier in the course. So after we've decided which variables to keep or drop in terms of confounders and other predictors that we might want to add to our model, then we're going to look for effect modification or interaction. So let's say we're interested in the effect of smoking on lung cancer and if this varies by or depends on age. So again, with interaction, you always want to think through conceptually whether this makes sense. In this case, it could. For example, smoking might have a stronger association with lung cancer at older ages compared to younger ages. So then there are two options that you have to investigate whether this conceptual understanding is reflected in the data. You can either build a model with an interaction term or you can fit stratified models. So let's discuss adding an interaction term first. If we add an interaction term, you need to include both the individual variables in first so smoking and age variables, as well as the interaction term between smoking and age. We then conduct a likelihood ratio test to determine if the model that includes the interaction term fits better than the model without the interaction term. If you do this and find that this is significant, it suggests that the effect of X on Y varies by Z. So you should report strata-specific effects. So with our example of the effect of smoking on lung cancer, if you found that there was a significant interaction between smoking and age in this model, 
This would suggest that the effect of smoking depends on age. So you would want to report the strata-specific effect of smoking for different ages. If you're asked what the effect of smoking is on lung cancer, in this case, it no longer makes sense to interpret the coefficient for smoking overall, because we've determined that the effect of smoking differs according to age. So therefore, we have to report the age-specific effect of smoking. Anything we say about the effect of smoking has to be stratified by or specific to age. If you found that the likelihood ratio test was close, but not quite significant, as many of you did with the age category times education interaction term on assignment 2, you might still want to calculate the strata-specific odds ratios or strata-specific effect to see if there's a large difference between age categories. And if you find that the odds ratio in one group is 4 and in another it's 1, you may want to report the strata-specific effects even though the likelihood ratio test was not significant, because there's such a large difference in these effects. This is because often when we're looking at an interaction, it's sort of like building a model for each of the subcategories of Z, which then have a smaller sample size. So we're splitting up the data a lot, which may decrease our power, and you might not achieve statistical significance. So if you really think conceptually that there could be an interaction, it might make sense to calculate the strata-specific effects in order to look at the magnitude of the difference in the effect across groups to see if there's a meaningful difference, and not just rely on that p-value. But I wouldn't worry too much about these borderline cases for the exam. It will likely be quite obvious if there's an interaction present on the exam, and Mike is not going to try to trick you. But these things often come up when you're running your own data in the real world, so it's more so that you know not to rely exclusively on statistical significance when examining effects, which I'm sure Mike has talked about. The second option for assessing effect modification is to build stratified models. This works well for categorical variables, but not so much for continuous variables, because you would need to fit a model for each level. So in our example of an age times smoking interaction, if age was a continuous measure, then you would have to fit a model for each age, which likely wouldn't work because you're splitting up the data so much. But if you had a categorical age variable like we did on assignment 2, you could fit a model for each of the age categories. An advantage of using stratified models is that we're able to calculate 95% confidence intervals for the effect in each stratum, which we can't easily do with our output with an interaction term. So after we've looked for confounders, predictors, and effect modification, the next thing that we're going to do is check our model assumptions and the goodness of fit for the model. Goodness of fit is something that we haven't discussed very much in this course, and the final exam information document indicates that you will not be assessed on this on the exam, so I'm not going to discuss the details of this here. But you should be able to answer questions about the assumptions for each type of regression model, including how to check these, and if they're violated, how they could potentially be addressed. So at this point, once you've assessed your assumptions, you want to make any adjustments to address any violated assumptions. So for example, if the linearity assumption is violated, you could categorize continuous variables, try log transforming, or using polynomial regression, which we've talked about previously. Now that you have your final model, you want to interpret your estimates. For the final exam, you're probably going to want to interpret any estimates with a 95% confidence interval if it's available. Again, I haven't seen the exam, so I don't know what the marking scheme will be, but I would just assume that rather than saying the beta coefficient is x or the odds ratio is 2, you should interpret this in a sentence as the odds of the outcome in group A is 2 times the odds of the outcome in group B, controlling for age, gender, or whatever else and we can be 95% confident that the odds of the outcome in group A is between one and three times the odds of the outcome in group B, adjusting for the other variables in your model. This is just like what you were asked to do on the assignments. Just because it shows you know exactly what these values mean and which groups are being compared. So which effect has a higher or lower likelihood of the outcome? 
Also, reporting the confidence interval provides information on the statistical significance of the effect, as well as the precision of your estimate, or the range of possible values. Remember that if you have a model with an interaction term in it, you must report the strata-specific effects. So if there's a significant interaction between smoking and gender, and the question asks you, what is the effect of smoking on the outcome? You must report the effect of smoking separately. One effect for men and one effect for women. And what if it asks about the effect of gender on the outcome? You have to report this effect separately for smokers and non-smokers. So keep that in mind. An interaction goes both ways. You can say the effect of smoking depends on gender, or the effect of gender depends on smoking. And of course, when interpreting an effect, you want to conclude whether there is a statistically significant difference between the groups compared or not. So do you reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis based on your p-value or confidence interval? Just as a side note, let's quickly discuss predictive models and the general approach for building these. The emphasis in this course has been on effect size modeling. You approach building a predictive model quite differently than an effect size model. With predictive modeling, we're trying to figure out which x's are good predictors of y, whereas with effect size models, we're trying to figure out which x's are needed to give the least biased estimate of beta 1. In other words, with predictive models, we're wondering which set of variables give the best prediction of the outcome. The goal is to get a good estimate of the outcome. For example, a question we might address with a predictive model is, how likely is a baby to have low birth weight? Whereas with an effect size model, we might answer a question like, if a mother smokes, how does that affect the likelihood of their baby having low birth weight? With predictive modeling, we do not interpret model coefficients. We're wondering, which variables do I need to estimate the outcome? We don't care about the individual effects of variables, just predicting the outcome. We assess predictive models using measures of predictive power, such as a likelihood ratio test, AIC, and R-squared type measures. And the ultimate goal is to include variables that maximize the model predictive power or reduce error. That being said, you don't want to include all x's in your data set, as this will lead to overfitting, and the model likely won't predict well with new data. Because there's no primary explanatory variable of interest with predictive models, and we're not interpreting individual coefficients, we do not assess confounding because this is not relevant. But we do want to check for collinearity and effect modification with the methods that we've discussed throughout the course. With a large data set with many variables, you likely wouldn't assess all possible interaction terms when checking for effect modification, but you'll want to check those that you think are the most important or plausible based on theory. But you should only include a few at most that you think are important. This is partly because including too many interaction terms could result in overfitting, but also you'll likely have strata or covariate patterns with few or no people in them, which makes your estimates unreliable. So once you've decided on a final model, you should validate your predictive model on new data that was not used to fit the model. There are lots of different ways that you can do this. For example, you can fit your model using only half of your data and then validate by assessing the fit or error with the other half. You won't be assessed on validation techniques as part of the course, but you should know the general idea of what it means to validate data. So this is just a summary of the types of regression models that we've gone over in the course. So again, we see the same structure in all of the models that we've looked at. So we have our intercept, although this is unspecified in a Cox model as we talked about in the last tutorial, but in linear, logistic, and Poisson regression, we have an intercept. And then we have our beta coefficients. With linear regression, we have a continuous outcome variable and the beta represents the change in the mean y for the group of interest compared to the reference group, if x is categorical, or with each one unit increase in x, if x is continuous. We do not exponentiate the beta coefficient in linear regression. With logistic regression, we're modeling the log odds, so we substitute the mean y for log odds in our interpretations. 
So the beta coefficient refers to the change in the log odds with each increase in x, or for the group of interest compared to the reference group. If we exponentiate that coefficient, we get our odds ratio. And we follow a similar process with Cox regression, where the beta 1 represents the change in the log hazard of the outcome, and we exponentiate this to get the hazard ratio. And with Poisson regression, the beta 1 is the change in the log expected count, or rate, and we exponentiate this to get the rate ratio. So we've already talked about this already in the tutorial, but if effect modification is present, this means that the effect of x on y is modified by or dependent on a third variable. So for example, the relationship between education and using contraceptives depends on whether or not you want children. So therefore, you cannot just report the overall relationship between x and y. This effect differs for different levels of z. For example, if both x and z are categorical, you would say that the relationship between smoking and death rate depends on age category, or the relationship between age category and death rate depends on whether or not you smoke. And you must calculate the rate ratio for smoke on the outcome within each age category if you're reporting the effect of smoke, and you must calculate the rate ratio for the age category within each smoking category if you're reporting on the effect of age. So let's look at an example where we're interested in the effect of smoking on death rate. And let's say we've already conducted a likelihood ratio test and found the interaction term between smoking and age category to be significant. If we're asked what the effect of smoking is on death rate, how would we report it? Since there are five age categories, and we have determined that the effect of smoking varies by age category, we would report five strata-specific odds ratios. So we went over the long way of how to do this in tutorial eight, but the short way to do this is to think about what differentiates smokers in each age category. If you were to write out the full regression equation for each group. So for example, if we're comparing smokers to non-smokers in age category C, within this age category, the only two coefficients that differentiate smokers and non-smokers are the smoking coefficient and the smoking times age category C interaction coefficient, where smokers have a value of one for these coefficients in the equation and non-smokers have a value of zero. So we add these together and exponentiate this value to get our rate ratio of 1.48. If one or both variables are continuous, we follow a similar process. Using the same example, but with an interaction term between smoking and a continuous age variable, we would say that the effect of smoking depends on age and calculate and report a rate ratio for smokers and non-smokers of different ages. Once you determine that you have a significant interaction, anything you say about the effect of smoking on death rate must be age specific. But again, you can also say that the relationship between age and death rate depends on whether or not you smoke. And if you're interested in the effect of age on death rate and find a significant interaction, you must calculate and report the rate ratio for a one-year increase in age separately for smokers and non-smokers. Let's turn to an example of a logistic regression model looking at the association between smoking and odds of CHD. And let's say we're interested in knowing if the effect of smoking varies according to age and have found that the interaction between smoking and continuous age was significant with a likelihood ratio test. How would we interpret the effect of smoking on odds of CHD? Since we've determined that there's a significant interaction and that the effect of smoking depends on age, anything we say about the effect of smoking needs to be interpreted for a given age. So how do we do this? We must assign ages to our continuous age variable that allow us to compare the effect of smoking for different ages. What do I mean by this? We must choose the ages that we're interested in. Let's say we're interested in the effect of smoking at age 50 and the effect of smoking at age 60. I've shown the long way here for those of you who are interested, but if you write out the full regression equation for smokers age 50 and non-smokers age 50, and then scratch out anything in the equations that either equals zero or is present in both of the equations for smokers and non-smokers, 
This leaves you with 1.95 minus 0 0.026. Again, these are the only values that differentiate smokers compared to non-smokers at different ages. You insert 50 and 60 into your respective equations and then exponentiate the totals to get odds ratios of 1.96 and 1.51. You interpret these as, for example, among those age 50, smokers have 1.96 times the odds of CHD than non-smokers. Okay, so let's turn to some linear regression interpretation practice. Our outcome is science score, and our explanatory variables are math score, gender, social studies score, and reading score. So first of all, how would you interpret the coefficients from this model in a sentence? We would say that for every one point increase in math score, we expect science score to increase by an average of 0.39 points, adjusting for gender, social studies, and reading scores. Females score on average 2.01 points lower than males on science when adjusting for math, social science, and reading scores. If we look at the p-value associated with the social studies coefficient, we see that this is greater than 0.05. So there is no significant association between social studies and science scores after adjusting for gender, math, and reading scores. And finally, for every one point increase in reading score, we expect science scores to increase by an average of 0.34 points, adjusting for gender, social studies, and math scores. So I've added these interpretations here for your reference. The next part of the question was, is there a difference between males and females on science scores? Interpret this in a sentence. Our answer would be, yes, females score an average of two points lower in science than males after adjusting for math, social science, and reading scores. Since our p-value is less than 0.05 and our confidence interval does not include zero, we can reject the null hypothesis that there's no difference in the science scores between females and males after adjusting for other test scores. The third question is, for a female with a math score of 20, a social studies score of 19, and a reading score of 23, what do you predict their science score to be? We simply plug these values into our regression equation, and our interpretation would be, a female with a math score of 20, social studies score of 19, and reading score of 23, would have a predicted science score of 26.69 points. So just a quick review of multiple linear regression assumptions. The first is independence. So all participants in our study were recruited independently of one another, which we know from study design. The next is that the relationship between X and Y is linear, which we can check with a residuals plot. If we look at an example, we're looking for a flat line with no pattern to the residuals plotted against the fitted values. We can see that this line is fairly flat in this example, suggesting that the linearity assumption is met. The third assumption is homoscedasticity, or equal variance, meaning that the error variance is constant, which we can also check with a residuals plot. To check homoscedasticity, we're looking for the cloud of points around the line in the plot to be fairly constant with no obvious pattern, such as a megaphone shape. We can see with this plot that there's no obvious pattern, suggesting that the homoscedasticity assumption is met. Our final assumption is normality, so the errors are normally distributed, which we can check with a QQ plot. If there's an approximately straight diagonal line to the points, such as the ones shown here, then the normality assumption is met. The errors appear to be normally distributed. So what about interpretations with logistic regression? Let's say our outcome is achieving honors, yes versus no, and our explanatory variables are gender, reading, and science scores. The first part of the question is to interpret each estimate in a sentence. We would say that the log odds of achieving honors is 1.48 higher for females than males, adjusting for reading and science scores. The log odds of achieving honors increases by 0.10 for every one point increase in reading scores, adjusting for gender and science scores. And the log odds of achieving honors increases by 0.09 for every one point increase in science scores, adjusting for gender and reading scores. And I've added these interpretations here for your reference. The next question is to describe the relationship between each x variable and the outcome in a sentence. 
We look at the p-values associated with the betas and see that these are all less than 0.05, suggesting a statistically significant relationship between all x's and achieving honors. We then exponentiate our coefficients to get odds ratios for each of the x variables. So for example, with the female gender variable, we exponentiate our coefficient of 1.48 to get an odds ratio of 4.39. As a side note, how would we calculate the 95% confidence interval for this odds ratio? We take our standard error of 0.44, multiply this by 1.96, and then add and subtract this from 1.48 to get the confidence interval for beta 1. We then exponentiate each of these values to get the confidence interval for the odds ratio. And we would interpret this as females have 4.39 times the odds of achieving honors compared to males adjusting for reading and science scores. And we can be 95% confident that females have between 1.85 and 10.41 times the odds of achieving honors adjusting for reading and science scores. So again, just another reminder of what we've discussed in the course you interpret the log odds as the difference or the change in log odds, so a decrease or increase in the log odds for women compared to men. But with odds ratios, you say that women have four times the odds, not 4.39 times higher the odds, because this isn't correct. Saying 4.39 times higher implies a 439% increase in the odds but an odds ratio of 4.39 actually represents a 339% increase in the odds, or 3.39 times greater the odds. So instead, you must interpret this as females have 4.39 times the odds, rather than 4.39 times higher or greater the odds compared to males. And I've also added the other interpretations for the other odds ratios here if you're interested. The next question is, do females have greater odds of achieving honors than males? So as we've just done, we look at our p-value associated with the female variable, and this is less than 0.05, and our confidence interval for the odds ratio does not include one. So we conclude, yes, females have 4.39 times the odds of achieving honors than males, adjusting for reading and science scores. The next question is, for a female with a science score of 20 and a reading score of 23, what are the odds that they will receive honors? So we plug these values into our formula to get the log odds and then exponentiate this to get the odds. We would then say that the odds of achieving honors for a female with a science score of 20 and a reading score of 23 are 0 0.007. The last question is, what is the odds ratio associated with a 10 point increase in science score? The coefficient for science is 0.09, which represents the difference in log odds for a one unit change in science score. To get an odds ratio associated with a 10 point increase, we multiply this coefficient by 10, and then exponentiate this value to get the odds ratio, which is interpreted as a 10 point increase in science score is associated with 2.46 times the odds of achieving honors, adjusting for gender and reading score. Remember that with any manipulations you do, such as multiplying by 10 like we did here, you must do this all before you exponentiate to get the odds ratio. So now let's revisit another example that we discussed earlier in the course. With this example from tutorial five, our primary explanatory variable had four groups or levels. We were estimating the odds ratio comparing the odds of CHD for those who were greater than 182 pounds to those who were between 155 and 170 pounds. So weight group four to weight group two. In this case, you would subtract the reference group coefficient, so those between 155 and 170 pounds, from the group of interest, so those greater than 182 pounds. So this would be 0 0.68 minus 0 0.43. And then you exponentiate this value to get an odds ratio of 1.29. So you don't exponentiate the coefficients before subtracting them to get the odds ratio. You must do this manipulation first. In this case, subtract one weight group coefficient from the other and then exponentiate. That being said, if you were given odds ratios here in place of coefficients, you could also divide these to get the odds ratio as shown here. So you exponentiate your coefficient for age category four and divide this by the exponentiated coefficient for age category two to get an odds ratio of 1.29. So both approaches will give you the same odds ratio. 
So now let's turn to logistic regression assumptions. Again, independence is the first one. So all participants in the study were selected independently of one another. And linearity. So the log odds is a linear function of the x's. This only needs to be checked with continuous explanatory variables. If you only have categorical variables, like we did on assignment 2, then you don't need to check this. So we're assuming that each continuous x variable is linear with y on the log odds scale. Remember that the relationship would be s-shaped if we were to model the probability. So we model the log odds and assume the log odds are linear with the x's. So linearity is the main assumption that we want to test statistically. The next assumption is more of a property of the model rather than an assumption, which is that y is binomial given x. We know this is true if we're modeling a binary outcome. We're also assuming that the x's are fixed values. And the final assumption is that the model fits well, which we could examine with a goodness of fit test, but you don't need to know the details about this for the exam. So linearity is the main assumption that you would want to test statistically. So how do we check this? We should check linearity for all continuous explanatory variables. You don't need to worry about checking this with categorical x variables. We discussed this in tutorial 8 if you want more information on this, but I'll just review it quickly. So there are a couple of options for checking linearity. The first is to divide the continuous x variable into categories and then calculate the proportion with the outcome in each category. And then you convert this proportion to log odds and plot this to see if it looks linear. And you want the points to fall on a line, like what's shown in the plot in the bottom right. The other option to check for linearity is to compare a model with x versus a model with x in a higher order term such as x squared or x cubed. Or you can transform x. So for example, you could try logging x. You can then check the linearity assumption again for the model with the higher order term or the transformed x to see if this addresses the problem. The problem with this second approach is that it won't capture every type of nonlinearity. For example, if you include x squared, this will only catch quadratic curve linearity. So because you can miss things, it's probably better to use the first option to check linearity and then you can use these types of transformations to address any problems with linearity that you may have. So an example of a type of question on the exam could be, does the linearity assumption appear to be met with the log odds plotted? And how could you address this if you found that this assumption was violated? Okay, so now let's turn to Poisson. So here we're modeling the number of days absent for school in one year. So what first jumps out at you when looking at this Poisson regression model. So we know that we can model counts or rates with Poisson. This data set has collected the number of days absent in one school year that each individual child was absent. So it's count data and we don't need to use an offset because everyone is followed for the same period of time. So essentially we're looking at the rate per school year which can be modeled as a count because for everyone the study period was the same length of time. So we don't need to enter an offset because there's no need to account for any differences in follow-up time between the individuals studied. We have the exact same follow-up time for everybody, and in that case, we can model the count. So how do we interpret each estimate? The coefficients can be interpreted as either the change in the log count of absences in one year or is the change in the log rate of absences per school year. So because everyone is followed for the same amount of time, whether you say it's a count or a rate per school year is the same thing. The log number of days absent in our study period of one year. So whenever you come across a question on the exam that's asking about the number of events, just make a note of whether or not everyone has the same follow-up time or not. And that will determine whether you model a count or a rate because follow-up time is the most commonly used as the offset when modeling rates. If everyone has the same follow-up time, you can model a count. But if they have different follow-up times, you need to account for that by including an offset for follow-up time and model the rate instead. The offset could also be an exposure like per unit space or number of people per group. So if that was the case, you would want to account for this as an offset. So here are our interpretations with this example. 
For example, females have a log rate or a log count in one year of absences that are 0.401 higher than males, adjusting for math and science scores. So we're starting to see a lot of similar statements coming up in our interpretations with the different types of regression models. Okay, so how do you describe the relationship between each x variable and the outcome in a sentence? So with the example of females versus males, how would you describe the relationship between gender and number of days absent from school per year? Again, we exponentiate our coefficients to get the rate ratio. So for a gender, we exponentiate 0.40, which gives us 1.49. And we would interpret this as females have 1.49 times the number of absences per year than males, adjusting for math and science scores. Or you could interpret this as females have a rate of absences per year that is 1.49 times the rate of males, adjusting for math and science scores. But what about math scores? What is the relationship between math scores and number of absences per year? Because the p-value associated with the math coefficient was not significant, and our confidence interval crosses 1, we interpret this as there is no significant relationship between math score and number of absences per year adjusting for gender and science score. So if this were a question on the exam, remember to always check if the confidence interval crosses 1 or if the p-value is less than 0.05, whichever is provided. So are females absent more often than males? By how much? So we've already looked at our p-value and found that yes, females have 1.49 times the number of absences per year than males, adjusting for math and science scores. So the next question is, for a female with a math score of 20 and a science score of 23, how many days absent would you expect? So again, we follow the same process that we did with logistic regression and enter these values and our coefficients into our regression formula. And this gives us the log count. So we exponentiate that to get the expected count and then interpret this as, we would expect a female student with a math score of 20 and a science score of 23 to have 0.85 absences per school year. So now we'll turn to Poisson assumptions. The first is independence. So not only individuals or groups are independent, but also events should be independent. So if I experience an event, my rate of experiencing a second event isn't going to go up because I experienced the first event, for example. If we know that the likelihood of an event is going to make you more likely to experience that event, then using a basic Poisson model is probably not the best model for your data. The second assumption is that the log rate is a linear function of the x's, or the event rate, or count, is a log linear function of the x's, similar to logistic regression. And we can check this again by plotting residuals or adding a higher order term, we're taking the log of x. We're also assuming that the rate is constant, that events are equally likely to occur at any time. So this means that the rate stays stable over time. This might not always be a realistic assumption. For example, the rate of relapse after treatment may decrease over time. And we're also assuming that the mean equals the variance for each level or combination of explanatory variables. And to check that, we check the dispersion parameter, which we discussed in the last tutorial. And what are we looking for? That this is equal to 1. If it's not equal to 1, so let's say it's greater than 2, which we said can be a rule of thumb as a cutoff in indicating over dispersion, what can we do to address this? As we discussed in the last tutorial, there are a couple of ways that you can address this. You can scale the standard error by the square root of the dispersion parameter. You can fit a model using the quasi-likelihood function, which is similar to the first solution or you can fit a model using the negative binomial. Okay, so now let's turn to Cox proportional hazards regression. Let's say we're modeling survival after breast cancer diagnosis. And our explanatory variables are whether or not participants use hormonal therapy, age, menopausal status, progesterone, and estrogen receptor status. So age is continuous and everything else is binary. So what does each of the coefficients represent? the change in the log hazard. And then we have our exponentiated coefficients, the hazard ratios, to the right of this. So how would we interpret the unexponentiated coefficient for hormonal therapy? 
We would say that women who receive hormonal therapy have a log hazard of death that is 0.346 lower than those who do not, adjusting for age, menopausal status, estrogen, and progesterone receptor status. Or women have a log instantaneous risk of death at a given time that is 0.346 lower than those who do not, adjusting for the other variables in our model. And I won't interpret the remaining coefficients, but they're here for your reference. The next question is, describe the relationship between each x variable and the outcome in one sentence. So we would interpret the hazard ratio for each x variable because this is more intuitive than the log hazard. So for example, women who use hormonal therapy have an instantaneous risk of dying at a given time that is 0.71 times those who do not use hormonal therapy adjusting for the other variables in our model. And I'll let you review the remaining interpretations on your own. The next question is, does hormonal therapy improve survival? By how much? Interpret this in a sentence. So we have a hazard ratio of 0.71, which is the complement of survival. So if we subtract our hazard ratio from one, we get 0.29. And we can therefore say, yes, hormone therapy improves survival by 29% after adjusting for age, menopausal status, estrogen, and progesterone receptor status. Alternatively, we can interpret this as those on hormone therapy have an instantaneous risk of dying at a given time that is 0.71 times those who do not use hormonal therapy, adjusting for the other variables in the model. The final question is, for a 59-year-old postmenopausal woman who has received hormonal therapy, was progesterone receptor positive and estrogen receptor negative, what is her predicted hazard, so risk of dying at a given time? So what's the problem here? Remember that we cannot calculate this because we do not have the baseline hazard. So even though we can calculate a hazard ratio to compare the hazard in group one to the baseline hazard, we don't know what that baseline hazard is. So we can't take all of our values from our regression output and calculate someone's hazard of the event at a particular time. Even though the baseline hazard is sort of like an intercept, the hazard at time t for observations when all predictors equal zero, we don't know what that hazard is. It doesn't have a fixed value. So we can use a hazard ratio to compare two groups or the change in hazard for a one unit increase in x, but we can't calculate someone's hazard at a particular time because we don't have the baseline hazard. We went over this in the last tutorial, so I won't get into details describing the Cox proportional hazards assumptions, but just a reminder that the main one that we're concerned with checking statistically is the proportional hazards assumption. This assumption means that the hazard ratio is the same regardless of what time you're looking at, time one, two, three, and so on. It doesn't mean that the hazard stays the same. So the hazard can change, but the relative difference between groups compared is constant over time. So that's all I have for this final tutorial. Thanks for making this a great semester and best of luck on the final exam. And I hope you have a great summer. Thanks for watching our video. Stick around guys, cause we got lots more.